When the chips are down, will we go to war with China? I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, and this episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. Uh, gentlemen, the chips I'm speaking of are semiconductor chips, the chips that go in everything from automobiles to microwave ovens to, you know, your smartphone. Uh, there's a big shortage of those right now that affect everything uh, that I've just listed. And in fact, in his most uh, recent stockholders uh, phone call, Elon Musk at Tesla said basically the only restraint on their growth was the availability of parts, specifically semiconductor chips. Uh, the biggest semiconductor, or I shouldn't say it this way, the most significant semiconductor manufacturer in the world is a company called Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company in Taiwan. They're only the 11th largest semiconductor manufacturer, but they make these really sophisticated chips that really put them in the place of being the most important of the manufacturers. And China has been uh, rattling sabers and suggesting a more active role in reunifying China with Taiwan. Uh, Bill Whittle, when it comes to a, uh, a, a national security perspective, Gerald Seib at the Wall Street Journal is uh, suggesting that the federal government get actively involved in fostering a U.S. domestic manufacturing industry for semiconductor chips. One of the reasons being not just economic, but national security. Do you think that this rises to that level, Bill, where, you know, in the old days, we used to talk about wars for oil. Maybe in the future, it's, it's wars for chips. Yeah, or silicon or other uh, rare earths, you know, that are that are yeah. necessary for making these things. Not that there's a shortage of silicon, but there's a shortage of a lot of other stuff too. Uh, look, I, I I don't I've never liked the idea of government giving businesses money. Not only am I against it on philosophical grounds, but I'm against it on just common sense grounds. If you subsidize a company uh, with government money, the company will just do worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But I would be in favor of tax breaks because I do think this is an issue that that is that needs to be. Uh, maintained at home. I, I remember the the the, uh, the the good old days of the uh, previous president, where we had not only enough oil domestically produced for us to run our economy, but to actually export some. It's kind of nice to to know that in the world that you live in, you're not dependent on the kindness of strangers uh, for your for your daily bread. And when we're talking about an information age economy, the chips are the are the that's the the snack food of the of the third wave of uh, of, of of technology of of, uh, of human achievement. I, I will say this, however, um, the the saber rattling you're talking about. Uh, we made a commitment to Taiwan uh, nationalist China, as you know, the nationalists lost uh, shortly after World War II. The communists. Uh, under Mao, um, pushed them off the mainland. They went to Formosa, which is now Taiwan. Uh, they've always been the people that have been our allies. They were the people that aided the Doolittle Raiders. 250,000 of them were killed for trying to save 80 American pilots. Uh, and those people in Taiwan are our friends. And the people on mainland China are not. Uh, it was up until relatively, up. in fact, I'll go further, up until January of last year, uh, of this year, rather, um, we had a, an honor obligation to protect Taiwan, and, and we'd made that very clear, that if that if communist China decided that they wanted to invade Taiwan and recapture what they claim is their own territory, they'd have to get across the Straits to Taiwan to do it, and uh, we weren't going to let that happen, and we can certainly stop them from doing that. I don't believe anymore that there's anybody in the Pentagon or in the White House who believes in things like national honor or, or things of that nature anymore. All this to say simply that if the only chips that are being made in the free world that are capable of being used in these small devices are made in Taiwan, then if I'm a Taiwanese, I would consider that a very valuable insurance policy in my back pocket because I think that I could no longer depend on the assurances of the federal government of the United States. I would think that there would be the most cynical of business interests making sure that that I was continuing to make these chips. And that's the world we live in today, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Stephen Green, uh, there are industry groups that have called on the Biden administration and on Congress uh, to get behind some legislation that is is extant. It already exists. It's just not going anywhere right now. Um, and Gerald Seib mentions this, that these industries are all kind of uh, calling for the federal government to get actively involved in the promotion and subsidy of this domestic semiconductor chip manufacturer. Do you think that the manufacturing companies in the United States look at that business and say, hey, I just 
just don't see a viable financial model unless the federal government gets involved? Or do they really, uh, you know, much more in touch with global trade than the average politician is? No. Do they don't, do they really not think this, that there's going to be a big problem with China or anything else? And they're, they're happy to have, you know, those chips being flown in on a jetliner. The, the, the three most complex things that consumers actually touch, the most complex to manufacture are cars, uh, jetliners, and computer chips. Uh, assembling cars is one of the most difficult things in the world, except that assembling an airplane is about 10 times harder than that, and doing a good shrink die on a computer chip is 10 times harder than that. Um, this isn't something where, like, where you get a, a billion dollars, where you get a billion dollars and say, hey, I think I'll start making chips. <laughs> and it, no, no, this is a very long, very technological and very expensive process. And you know what you do with an old fab when uh, the chips it makes are too outdated? You close it because it's useless. This field is so capital intensive, Scott, that you can't do this kind of stuff on a whim. Well, it's Steve, not, let, me, let uh, me follow up on that well, point because no, I no, wonder no, 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 why the chip manufacturers in the United States don't do what the Japanese steel manufacturers did to the U.S. steel industry, which is basically oh, well, com come up with modern plants that can ch for uh, manufacture more cheaply than the big U.S behemoths. Why can't we well, no, okay. steal the march on the yeah, uh, Taiwanese? Japan's industrial planning went approximately nowhere. It was good when Japan was still a startup, but once Japan got rich, uh, their Ministry of Information and Tech, MIDI, I think it was called, uh, just just got a stranglehold on the economy. So I'm I'm with Bill on this. You you do know don't want government dictating technology at all. Um, that said, we're not in this position because we got undercut by Taiwan or uh, or by uh, by South Korea, Samsung makes a lot of these chips too, uh, or even by uh, by communist mainland China. It's Intel screwed up. Andy Grove, the co-founder of Intel, his slogan was, and he even wrote a book called this, Only the Paranoid Survive. He retired and Intel stopped being paranoid. Apple came to them in 2005 or 2006 and said, we're going to make this thing. It's called an iPhone. Uh, it's top secret. We want you to make the chips for it. And instead of being paranoid that these little pocket computers might someday sell more units than personal computers powered by Intel ever would, Intel said, no, go away. That's a niche market. We're not interested. We wish you all the luck in the world. Well, Everybody carries one of these computers in their pockets now. None. I, I, I think the, uh, the, the, the smartphone market is something like uh, 50 times larger, 25 times larger than the PC market is in terms of unit sales. Every single one of those smartphones has a chip in it not powered by Intel. Every single one. So Intel isn't getting the development money out of profits anymore. Those profits are going to Taiwan Semi and to Samsung, which is why they're developing the more and more complicated, harder to make chips. It's called a die shrink. You measure it in nanometers. Uh, Intel is stuck in like 14 and 10 nanometer production. Taiwan Semi went to, uh, to uh, five nanometers last year. They're moving to four this year. They're moving to three probably next year, and nobody can touch them. Uh, and this is Intel's fault. They missed out on a, a once in a generation light, once in a generation opportunity to make money and remain on the cutting edge of chip technology. And they went, eh, who's going to buy a pocket computer? So that's where we are now. Um, I do not want government getting in bed with business and saying, OK, these are the chips you're going to make and this is what we're going to pay you. What I would, however, do, the question isn't whether Intel makes the chips or Taiwan Semi makes the chips or Samsung makes the chips or any, anybody else. And by the way, Chinese chips suck. They're like 30 and 40 nanometer process. They're for cars and things. Their chip industry is years and years behind Intel and Intel is years behind uh, Taiwan Semi. So all that aside, what I might do if now what I would actually endorse, it pains me to say this, but I would endorse it, is say a $30 billion a year program where if you build chips in this country, we don't care who you are, but if you build chips in this country on the most advanced process available, whether that's five, four, or three nanometers, we will buy those chips and then sell them at cost to whatever computer or phone maker wants to have them. There's a, in that Wall Street Journal story by Gerald Seib, 
Um, he mentions that over the next decade, it's anticipated that 40% of the growth in the manufacturing of semiconductor chips is going to be in China. Uh, so China is not sitting still when it comes to this. I have always marveled when I hear these stories about the chip shortage that we lack a domestic industry. And there are some things that make sense to manufacture overseas where labor is cheap. If I were making sneakers, you'd have to take a serious look at Vietnam or Malaysia or someplace like that where uh, the people there can earn a decent day's wage for Malaysia uh, by manufacturing sneakers, but you couldn't do the same thing here. You'd have to charge a lot more for the end product. Uh, what doesn't make sense to me is something that is so highly computerized and so highly mechanized and robotized um, that it can, it's like we treat it like it could only be done in an Asian country, for example. Uh, as if there's no profit to be made in that business. So why aren't there lots of entrepreneurs in the United States or syndicates of entrepreneurs and investors who are saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could have a US-based manufacturing facility for semiconductor chips? Because naturally that would uh, you know, draw a lot of the business from the military, from domestic car manufacturers, uh, from the handful of domestic computer companies, even those who manufacture overseas because it would be a badge of honor. Uh, so why does the government have to get involved? On the other hand, just like we have a strategic nat national petroleum reserve so that we have petroleum on hand in case of war, maybe we need a, a, a silicon chip uh, reserve or a gallium chip reserve or whatever the next technology in <laughs> chips is going to be. Uh, it may make some sense for the federal government to get more actively involved in at least promoting, um, and I, like Bill, have no problem with giving tax breaks for this. I mean, if you can get a tax break for buying a, a rental property and renting it out to somebody else, I, because that's something that's good for the economy overall, I have no problem granting tax breaks for people who are making something that would not only help in defense, but keep the U.S. from being completely reliant on something like a computer chip uh, to overseas powers. If Xi Jinping is the chairman of Taiwan Semiconductor, uh, we may have more problems than we realize, even if we're able to continue to buy chips from Taiwan Semiconductor. Do you really want the chip that Xi Jinping is making? I don't know, especially if things get more hostile with China. I'm not sure I want to carry that thing around in my pocket. I've got enough problems with what I'm already carrying around in my pocket. <laughs> So uh, from a national security perspective, from an economic perspective, from a de domestic manufacturing and, uh, you know, to quote our president, jobs, jobs, jobs perspective, all of that would seem to mitigate toward the idea of a stronger national industry of manufacturing these things. And as a conservative, the only way I can justify wanting the federal government to get involved is from the national defense perspective of things. And I think there's a case to be made for that. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Odd. Thanks to the members of BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.